As promised, in today's video, I'm going to be taking you through setting up a home server from start to finish on a real bare metal host using this bad boy right here. Today, we're going to be going over the entire thing from start to finish. So there's going to be chapters in the description if you're only interested in specific parts or if you want to skip over the boring stuff. We're going to be going through the creation of installation media, the operating system install and the SSH any% percent speed run, disk mirroring, SSH configuration hardening, setting a message of the day, installing Docker, installing some example services, and setting up a firewall. Hopefully by the end of the video, you'll have a very basic home server setup that you can start to mess around with and bootstrap your own ideas. This video is gonna be filmed a little bit asynchronously because I'm a busy beaver today. So if you notice the lighting change or the clock on the wall jump around, that's probably why. I might film the intro, film the outro, go do some stuff, and then film the meat of the video. Let's dive right in. This is what we're working with, as you can see. It's an Acer Aspire X3950. We've got a Core i5-650, that's a dual-core four-thread processor from around 2009, 2010. We've got eight gigs of RAM, and this particular computer was manufactured around 2010 to 2011. Basic stuff, I know, but you'll see in this video exactly what we can do with so little. To create the installation media, you're going to want to head over to debian.org. We're going to be using Debian for this video for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's one of the oldest and most supported stable Linux distributions, and I think it's a great all-rounder for a server setup. Number two, unlike some other server operating systems, the Debian team hasn't routinely tried to screw over forks and other community projects. And number three, they provide the entirety of the Debian operating system in all of its feature set for free without any need for subscriptions or other purchases. So to grab a copy of Debian, head over to debian.org and just hit this big download button right here. Once you've copped your copy of Debian, the next step is to figure out whether or not the system that you're going to be targeting has UEFI or BIOS. For UEFI systems, I would say anything after Intel's third generation core processors, so that's the Intel 3000 series of Core i CPUs, is most likely going to be using UEFI. If you're on something older, it's most likely going to be using BIOS. If you're trying this on a Ryzen setup, 100% going to be UEFI. This determines the next step, which is formatting your installation media. The steps are slightly different for BIOS or UEFI. I'm going to demonstrate this both on Windows and Linux, starting with Linux, so you can skip to Windows in the chapters below if you're on that system. The system I'm going to be targeting is running a BIOS legacy system. So when I go ahead and select my partition table over here on my USB drive, I'm going to select MS-DOS. If you were running UEFI, you would select GPT here. The rest of the steps should be exactly the same. So go ahead and create a new partition table, like so. For uh, this on Linux, the utility I'm using is KDE Partition Manager, although GNOME Disks or Gparted will do equally the same. The GUI is just going to be slightly different. Once you've done that, the next step is to DD your um, ISO onto the USB. So you can do that by opening a terminal window, CDing to where your download is, find out which uh, disk your uh, USB drive is. For me, it's dev slash SDD. Make sure that you get this right because it'll be a little bit spicy if you don't. You might end up using one of your operating system drives as a Debian install disk, which is not going to be great. The next thing you're going to do is go in and type sudo dd if equals, uh, and then you want to do the Debian installation. I actually have a couple here, so let me pick out the latest one. Uh, 12.4, that'll be the one. Uh, set the output to your USB drive. And I always include this flag here to give me a progress update. Uh, go ahead and put in your password and it'll start copying over to your USB drive. I'll see you when it's done. If you're on Windows, the same thing I said about UEFI versus BIOS in the Linux section applies here as well. If you're running an Intel Core 3000 series or newer, you're likely running UEFI. If it's older, it's likely BIOS. And if you're in the middle there, you might just want to double check. Anyways, come on over to rufus.ie slash en for English, but they have other languages here as well if you prefer. Scroll down to the downloads section. 
And here I usually just take the portable edition because you don't have to install anything, you can just double click an EXE. So go ahead and grab that one, and then as soon as it's done, open it up right here, and you'll be presented with this. Select your USB drive from the drop down menu, be sure to select the right one. Um, and then here hit select to select your Debian installation image, which is right here for me. And here's where you've got to make a decision. This is the only thing where what you're doing and what I'm doing is going to differ throughout the video. The rest of the steps are going to be exactly the same. So here you just need to choose a partition scheme, which is for BIOS or UFI. So if you're targeting an older BIOS based system like I am, you'd select MBR here. But if you're selecting uh, GPT, you're going for a UEFI based system, so 3000 series or newer. We're going to be using MBR. Um, so go ahead and hit start. The rest of these defaults are perfectly fine. Uh, writing in ISO mode is fine. And it's going to prompt you right here to just include, like, go and fetch the latest versions of the installation um, files, which is fine. So just go ahead and hit yes here. It'll do some downloads, copy over the information, make sure to hit OK here because of course we want to overwrite the disk, and uh, it'll go ahead and flash the USB for us. So I'll see you when it's done. Power your machine on. We're looking for the boot device selection menu. For me this is a key like F12, but for you it might be different according to your manufacturer. Once it loads up, we're going to select our USB device that has the Debian installer on it from the list. And on this menu, we're going to select Graphical Install. I'll be right back when it boots up. We're here at the Install menu. I'm going to select English as my language, but if you prefer a different one, now is the time to select one. I'm also going to go ahead and select Australia as my region, and American English as my keyboard. Of course, if you are in a different region with different um, standards, then you would select the ones appropriate for you. Now it's going to extract the installation files and mount them to somewhere on the file system. This can take a while depending on the speed of your USB drive, so I will be right back when it's all done. Here it's detecting network, so you're going to want to configure yours over Ethernet. Again, this might take a little while, so I'll be back when this step is done. The Debian installer is nice in that it will do the network configuration for you as long as you have an Ethernet cable plugged in. It's time to pick a host name for the machine. Your host name that you choose here should follow the same naming conventions as the rest of your home network. If you don't have any conventions, now would be the time to make some. For me, I use the first five Pokemon generations, towns and city names as my host names. So I'm going to continue the theme here and call this one Little Root. The domain name, as the installer says, you can make something up since this is a home network. If you need to specify something custom here, you'd know. Going to make a password for the root user. Um, I'm just going to use password one here. Very secure, I know. Um, if you were actually going to deploy this server, so for you tagging along at home, you're going to want to come up with something a little better than password one. So a full name for your new user. I'm just going to make it my name. And the username, just like your host name, follow the same naming conventions as the usernames from your other machines. I'm going to call this one MDHoff. That's what I use. Password for the new user, I mean, password one, you already know. And the clock, so it's going to ask for your time zone. I'm currently in Queensland, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. And we're going to go on to the disk partitioning. So this one might be a little bit, um, a little bit scary if you haven't done disk partitioning before, but it's really not so bad. So what we're going to go ahead and do is use entire disk and set up encrypted LVM. I would always recommend that you encrypt your disks. You may or may not want to encrypt the operating system drive of your server based on various things. So for example, it's quite difficult to have the server start up at random times of the day if your disk is encrypted because it will ask you for a password prompt when you turn the machine on. Actually, because most of you probably won't be doing that, we're just going to use the standard LVM. But if you want to encrypt your operating system disk, it's not too much of a big deal. It'll just ask you for a password in this step as well. 
So go ahead and select your operating system drive. I'm going to select this two terabyte device here. And um, after I finish filming this section, I'm going to go and add some extra drives to this so I can show you how to mirror some stuff. But we'll just use this one for now. And all files in one partition is perfectly fine unless you are advanced enough that you want to try these other ones. Personally, I've never really felt the need for it. I think um, it's just kind of annoying because resizing partitions after you install them, especially when the root partition is involved, can be a little bit annoying. So I just keep it all on one partition. And of course, we're going to go ahead and select yes here. I should note everything on that drive will be overwritten. So just be absolutely sure that you've selected the right disk here. Um, it'll probably go ahead and select the max for you, but if not, as you can say, as you can see there, it says you can just type in max, but two terabytes is the max for me, so we can use that. And these are the logical volume groups it's going to create. I might do a different video on LVM and, and Linux disk partitioning, but for now, all you should know is that you can have a look and see that you've got a root volume a swap volume, which is just uh, virtual memory, um, and you've got a boot partition there, which is going to be ext2. It's going to go ahead and create all of these uh, partitions. Might take a little bit of time depending on the speed of your disk, so I will come back when it's done. It'll jump into installing the base system immediately after you've finished partitioning. Again, this is probably going to take a while, so I'll come back when this is done as well. After the base system is installed, you'll be presented with this screen. Essentially, all it's asking is for the package manager dpkg and apt, its front end, where do you want to download all of your packages from when the system is installed? So usually it's best to select the country that you're in because that's where the closest servers will be to you and therefore the fastest. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and select Australia for this as it selects based on the region I selected way back in the first step. Then it's going to ask me for a mirror. Now you can choose a couple of different ones, but deb.debian.org, as it says here, is a good choice. That's the, you know, debian.org. However, there are different organizations, for example, Digital Pacific, Service Australia, AARnet, that host mirrors for Debian as well. I'm just going to leave it as default here. HTTP proxies, we're not going to do that in this video, I'm going to leave it blank. And it's going to go ahead and configure the package manager. I'll be back when it's done. Go ahead and read all this garbage. I'm going to select no to popularity contest, but it's up to you if you want to participate. Oh, I feel like I'm saying this all the time, but there's just so many little screens like this for us to wait through. Okay, here's something interesting. So it's going to choose. let us choose some core pieces of software. Um, this is a server, so we're not going to actually select any desktop environment here. It's going to be completely headless, meaning no graphical environment. We are going to go ahead and install an SSH server. You can select web server here. I don't actually know what web server it installs. We're going to go ahead and set up Nginx in a container later though, so I'm just going to uncheck this for now. Uh, yeah. I'll see you when this is done. It's going to ask us which device to install the bootloader to. You're going to want to select the one that you installed the operating system to. In this case, again, it's this 2 terabyte drive here. So Grub is the bootloader that Debian uses. Some other distributions use systemd boot, but Debian hasn't swapped over yet. In my opinion, I prefer Grub, but people have their own opinion on systemd and its utilities. Congratulations, my friends, we are done. Debian is ahead and installed on our system. So we're just going to hit continue and reboot. So now comes the time when we do the SSH any% percent speedrun. Basically, we want to get to the SSH login as fast as we can so that we can leave this machine where it is, go back to our nice setup over on the desktop, and do all the rest of the configuration from there. So we're going to go ahead and let this boot up for the first time. Actually, it's not the first time. Uh, as I said, I'm filming this asynchronously, so it went ahead and rebooted, and then I shut it down, went and did a bunch of stuff, and now we're back. So, um, a couple things to note about this. It's going to boot into a text-based interface, much like just a standard command line shell. 
you're not going to be met with a graphical interface because of course we don't actually need one. So it's going to go ahead and boot us to this login screen here. I'm going to log in as root, enter our very secure password. And the first thing I'm going to do is type in IP ADDR to dump our network information. I'm going to note down the IP address of ENP1S0, that's my Ethernet adapter. Yours will be named something similar, but maybe not exactly the same. So as you can see there, my INET address is 192.168.1.85. Yours will likely be different, so just note down what it is. And I'm going to verify that SSHD is uh, running here with systemctl. And as you can see there, uh, SSHD is in fact running. So we can hop on over to the desktop and try to SSH in. I think you and I can both agree this is a bit more comfortable. We're going to go ahead and log into the machine using the parameters we created earlier. So open up a terminal on your desktop and type in SSH, the username you created, at the IP address that we noted down just before. Hit enter. This is going to ask if you want to add the machine to your computer's list of known hosts, which of course we do want to do. And enter the very secure password that you selected earlier. And here we are on the machine. That's the SSH any% percent speedrun done. Take whatever timestamp it is in this video and I challenge you to beat it. Considering that I had to do a whole lot of filming and cuts and setup and things, you'll probably find it quite easy. Now that we've logged into the machine, there's a couple of admin things we need to get out of the way, no pun intended. The first of which is setting up sudo. If you're not sure what sudo is, go ahead and Google it before continuing because we're going to dive a little bit deeper than sudo in this video. So the first thing to do is elevate yourself to a root shell with this command here. Enter the right password. Um, I think I just entered password instead of password1. That's embarrassing for me. And now we're going to go ahead and apt install sudo. I'm also going to add vim onto the end of this because that's my preferred text editor. If you like nano or if you like ed, for instance, just replace Vim with whatever your editor of choice is whenever I'm editing a text file in this video. But I like Vim, so I'm going to use that. Go ahead and install these. And then when it's done, we're going to type this command here, which is user sbin vsudo. Um, now, vsudo is not actually in the system's path by default on Debian for some reason. Um, so you, if it says not found, if you try to execute vsudo, just put the full path in, which is this one here. And the, uh, the line that we want to note here is this one, where it says, allow members of group sudo to execute any command. So sometimes this will be commented out depending on the distribution that you're setting up. On Debian, it looks like it is uncommented by default. Essentially, what this means is that users in the sudo group are going to be allowed to use sudo along with their password to elevate their privileges to the root user, which is fine. So now we know what group we need to add our user to. So I'm going to go ahead and do user mod dash ag. Now for this next one, I always forget what the order is. Is it the group first or is it the user first? I have an inkling it's the uh, user first. So I'm going to try that. Sudo user mod not found. I bet it's an sbin. Yep. Might want to go ahead and add that to the path later. User sudo does not exist. Okay, it's the other way around. For some reason, I just cannot remember the <laughs> the order for this particular command. But there we go. So my user is now in the uh, sudoers group. So to test this, go ahead and exit out. Try doing a sudo su. Put in your user's password instead this time. I might actually have to re-SSH in. Give me a second here, guys. Yeah. So you'll have to re-SSH in to make the, uh, the new group membership properly apply. But now as you can see, we are ready to sudo. <laughs> um, so the next thing we're going to go ahead and do is harden our SSH configuration. Because currently SSH is insecure for a server in a couple of ways. So number one, it's still on port 22, which is the default SSH port. And many automated scripts will target port 22. They'll just have it, you know, because they're looking for low hanging fruit a lot of the time. Um, and doing a full port scan takes a lot of time. So usually they only target port 22. So we're gonna change that to something random and arbitrary. It's more of a security through obscurity feature. If someone really wants, they can do a full port scan on you. So there's other measures we're gonna take as well. That's one of the first things you wanna change. 
The second thing is to swap from password authentication to public key authentication. Now, this just means that you don't, you won't be able to enter a password to authenticate with the machine. You need to use cryptographic key authentication, which is stronger and more secure than passwords ever will be. So before we go ahead and change these parameters, we're going to take a couple of preemptive measures. So on our machine over here, we are just going to generate a public key to log into the server with. So to do that, you can use SSH keygen on both Linux and Windows. Now it's going to ask us where we want to save the file. I'm just going to save this as um, video demo. You can enter a password here to encrypt the file if you like. My disks are running full disk encryption, so I'm not really fussed about this. But if your disks are unencrypted, you might want to consider. So now I'm going to go ahead and cat out the public key for this preemptively, which is this one right here. And I'm going to go ahead and copy that to my clipboard, because what we're going to be doing is adding that to the uh, system over here before we fully enable public key authentication. So back on this machine over here, we're going to go ahead and edit this file. It is Etsy SSH SSD, SSHD config. <laughs> it's a bit of a tongue twister. So here we are, and as you can see right here is the port. So for this video, I'm just going to add two twos onto the end of this, and we'll make it port 2222. Um, so that's what we're going to change our port to. And now another thing that we're going to go ahead and do here is disable root login over SSH, because there is no good reason now that we've set up sudo for the root user to ever be allowed to log in over uh, the internet. So we're going to change that to no. Um, and again, again, like scripts will include the root user as the login user because every Linux machine has a root user. Um, whereas, you know, your machine could have a different, like almost unguessable username and they would just be denied access right off the bat. But every machine has a root user. Uh, public key authentication is yes by default. I'm just going to uncomment it here to make sure that we, you and I both know that we're using it uh, correctly. And here we're going to change password authentication to no, because we actually want to completely disable password authentication, remove that vector of attack completely, and just swap over to public key authentication. This is enough for now. There's a lot more hardening options you can dive into, but for this basic setup, this is going to be good enough for us. I might do another video on um, SSH hardening. Who knows? We'll see. Um, so now exit out of this root shell if you haven't already. And we're going to edit a file called, I'm actually going to need to make this directory, uh, .ssh slash authorized keys. So this is where we're going to put that public key earlier. You might have to make that .ssh directory as well if it doesn't exist for you. Um, so once that's done, we can go ahead and just paste our key that we created earlier into this file right here and it should let us log in. So write that file, and now we're going to restart SSHD with this command here. So Debian, like most Linux distributions, is using systemd, and systemctl is the sort of service manager command configuration utility. You can do things like check the logs, start services, stop services, restart services. If you change the configuration for a lot of services like we've just done here, you're probably going to need to restart them. So we'll restart SSHD and we will log out. Now, try running this command again. You'll notice that it fails. Why does it fail? Because SSH's default port is 22 and we've just changed that. You can specify the port you want to connect to like this. Now you'll notice we've got a different message this time. You've been see, you can see that we've been denied because of our public key. We're no longer allowing password authentication for security purposes. So even though we've got the right port, if we don't specify the right key, it'll still boot us off. So now we're going to specify dash I for identity. And then we're going to choose the identity that we just added to the authorized keys file. As you can see, we can log in now, even without a password. How neat. And it's more secure as well. Just make sure that nobody is ever able to read that uh, key of yours. <laughs> So that's, that's like some basic SSH hardening features. As I said, there's more, but that's good enough for now. Let's move on to the next thing. 
I went ahead and added some more disks to the system so I can show you how to set up mirroring. Let's have a look with the lsblk command. As you can see there, I have sdb and sdc. sdb is a 120GB SSD and sdc is a 500GB hard drive. What I'm going to do next is set up a 120GB partition on the 500GB hard drive and use that to mirror the 120GB partition on the SSD. To do that, we're going to use fdisk. So type in sudo fdisk and then specify the device that we're wanting to target. First, we'll look at sdb. So the first thing we want to do is create a new GUID partition table. You can do that with the command g. Even if you're on a legacy system, it's best to use GPT here because this is not a boot device and MBR uh, partition tables can only support up to two terabytes. So for general data, it's best to use GPT always. So once that's done, press N to create a new partition. Having the partition number as one is perfectly fine here. First sector by default is perfectly fine. And I'm gonna do a plus 119G because if you had a look at the LSB command, um, I only actually have 119 to play with on this particular device. Um, I'm going to go ahead and remove this signature. If you're using a fresh disk, it won't have a signature, but because there was something previously on the device, it's just giving me a warning to say that there was something that it found on the device and um, making sure that I actually do want to remove that. So I'm going to go ahead and hit W for write. If I do LSBLK again, you'll see there we have created sdb1, which is a 120 gigabyte partition. We're gonna do the same thing on sdc. So here, we're just gonna set up another GUID partition table, create a new partition, go through the defaults, plus 119g, select yes, and write. So if you have a look now, you can see we've got sdb1 and sdc1, which are our uh, partitions that we're going to mirror. So the next step to do is create the ButterFS file system. You can do, uh, before we do that though, we're actually gonna have to install the ButterFS utilities. So to do that, you wanna install ButterFS procs, like this. I've already installed it, um, but it'll prompt you to install it if you haven't already. I don't think it's installed in Debian by default, so you're gonna wanna go ahead and grab that. The next thing you want to do is mkfs.butterfs. Run all these commands as root, of course, so you can do that with either sudo or through a root shell. Um, and the next thing we're going to do is do dash d for, and raid one. What this means, so dash d is the flag for data. So essentially what this is saying is we want to have butterfs manage our data in raid one. Dash m is metadata. So we specify RAID 1 as well. So we're mirroring both data and metadata. Um, and now we select which devices we want to include. So dev slash sdb1 is going to be the primary partition. This means that all of our mount um, setup is going to be targeting sdb1. And now we're going to put in our secondary one, which is sdc1. So this is where all of our data is going to be mirrored to. Go ahead and hit enter there, and as you can see, it's complete, and we now have two devices in this little pool. Um, one is sdb1, and the other is sdc1. So, that's great. Now we're going to make the system recognize them and mount them at boot time. So, the first thing you're going to want to do is decide on where you actually want to mount this extra file system. Typically, I use uh, slash hdds. Um, it's better, in my opinion, not to use slash mnt, because that's kind of... Um, that's managed automatically by the system in some cases as well. Like if you plug in a USB device, sometimes it'll mount it in slash MNT. So I prefer to make my own directory, but you can do whatever you like. So I'm gonna make slash HDDs, and then I'm also going to make um, SW RAID as an example, because we're mounting a software RAID here. These can be arbitrary, these can be whatever you want. Um, and they can be even something funny or clever. Just make your server a little bit more interesting for you to administer. Um, now the next thing we're gonna do is mount these at boot. So to do that, have a geese at BLK ID. Essentially, what we were using before, so SDB and SDC, these are actually fluid. Like these can change depending on uh, system reboots. So your devices aren't always going to be SDB or SDC in all cases it's better to use the UUID of the partition to identify it. So here in BLKID, let's have a look. So SDC1 has this UUID right here, and SDB1 has this UUID right here. 
If you remember, SDB1 was our primary, so we're going to use its UUID to, um, to mount it at boot. So go ahead and just copy this UUID right here. And next we're going to edit a file called etsy slash fstab. Some people call it fstab, some people call it fstab. I typically refer to it as fstab when I'm thinking about it in my brain, but um, there's a, there's, it's kind of a hotly debated topic. Um, so just go ahead and open it up and you'll see we already have some entries here. So the system has configured a couple of things for us by default. Now, what we're going to do is type UUID, paste the UUID in for SDB1, and this is essentially telling uh, FSTab, you know, which partition we want to mount at boot. The next thing here to specify is the mount, uh, the mount point that we want to do this on. You can already see we ha kind of have an example um, right here with the boot partition. So it's got a UUID right here. Its mount point um, along here is slash boot. The file system type is ext2. Um, the options are defaults. And then these two here can be set by the system automatically, but we're going to use um, zero and zero for that, which is usually just fine. Um, so go ahead and specify your mount point here. HTD slash software raid. Specify the file system type, butterfs. Specify defaults, and then zero zero. I might make another video on file systems and FS tabs where I explain some of this stuff in more detail, but because this is a very general overview basic type video, you might have noticed I'm not really going deep into the details here. Um, but if you are interested in hearing more about like the more advanced options for configurations of things like this, and especially the FS tab, let me know in the comments and I might do a video on it. So write the file. And um, I'm going to go ahead and reboot the machine. I'll, uh, I'll rejoin you when it's back up. Okay, system's back up. Let's have a look. So here's a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier. As you can see, the partition that we set up to be our primary and software rate has actually changed itself to be SDA, and our root device has changed to SDB. So that's why it's always a great idea to use UUIDs instead. But as you can see here, it's mounted at HDDs slash software RAID. The next thing we want to do is set up a sub volume to hold all of our various information. If you're familiar with ZFS, uh, sub volumes are kind of analogous to a data set. Essentially, it's not a extra partition in of itself. It's more like a um, semantic separation of data on the, on the ButterFS file system. So it's a good practice to almost go in and separate them for different types of tasks or things like uh, you could do it however you want. Usually I separate my um, sub volumes and data sets based on, um, you know, the purpose, what services they're going to be serving, things like that. Um, for this video, I'm going to make a sub volume for each service that we're going to be configuring today. So I'll just go ahead and elevate myself to root. And what I'm going to do is type in butterfs sub volume create. And the next um, argument here, the first three are pretty self explanatory, right? But the next volume, the next um, argument here is going to be the path to the sub volume. Now, this should be, you should specify HDD software RAID because that's the root of our uh, butterfs file system. And next, you actually specify what you want the sub volume to be called. So I'm going to do one called Nginx, because we're going to be setting up Nginx as well. I'm going to do one called Games, because we're going to be setting up a Minecraft server. And I'm going to do one called Cloud, because we're also going to be setting up Samba. So now that you've done that, you can actually have a look at um, LS, and you can see here it's created three new subvolumes for us. And if you go ButterFS subvol list, you can use subvolume or subvol is shorthand. Uh, HDD software RAID. You can see there we've got three new subvolumes. So cool. Next, we're going to move on to Docker, set up some services, and then we're going to actually mount these inside of the containers so we can actually use them. Okay, now we can actually have some fun. We're going to install and set up Docker, which is what we're going to be using for containers on this particular server. Docker is the industry standard. There are other containerized solutions available, but Docker is probably the most popular. There are plenty of guides for it, and it's pretty easy to get going. Now, 
Docker does provide a repository that you can add to your apt sources list, but we're not really going to do that in this video. It's a bit outside the scope. We're just going for something basic. The ones packaged with Debian are fine for our purposes here. So we're just going to go ahead and sudo apt install docker.io, docker compose, and docker doc. So there's quite a bit to download here, and it might take a while. So I'll rejoin you when it's all done. Now, if you remember, I was showing off the systemctl command earlier. We're going to go ahead and use that again here to make docker start at boot. So to do that, it's systemctl enable. Make sure I spell that right. God, what is up with me today? Docker. So now, as you can see, it adds docker to our startup services. And we can go ahead and start this with systemctl start docker, as you might imagine. The astute among you might have noticed that there's actually a way to do both those steps in one. So it is uh, sudo systemctl enable dash dash now docker. So that's a little shortcut you can use in future if you like. So docker started, we're going to go ahead and install some containers and services, make this thing a little bit more fun. So the first thing we need to do is add our user to the docker group so that we actually have permission to chat with the docker daemon. To do that, we can just use sudo sbin user mod ag. And I remember which order the group is in this time, guys. Come on. It's um, it's group first and then username. So go ahead and do that. And then re-log in to make the groups apply. And you can see that I'm in the Docker group. We're going to pull some container images. Now, an image is essentially just a, um, a pre-made container environment for us to look at. The first one we're going to be pulling is the uh, Debian one. So we're just going to pull a Debian blank container. And the reason we're doing that is so that we can go in and use this container for whatever we want. It's just going to be a standard Debian container. We can do everything we'd want to do on the host system within that container and set up whatever services we want. The second container we're going to be pulling is the Nginx container because they have an official one that we don't need to bother setting up ourselves in a standard Debian one. So we're just going to go ahead and pull these. They'll, they'll pull the latest ones by default, but you can specify custom tags if you like, and you can have a look at the actual official um, container page on Docker's website to see what kind of tags you can choose from. But the latest tag is fine for us. I'll see you when it's ready. The Nginx container is ready to be deployed. The first thing I'm going to do is create a new directory. I'm going to make HTTPS software raid Nginx www. If I were you, this is where I'd be storing my static website content that uh, Nginx is going to serve. This is what we're going to pass into our Docker container. So I'm going to go ahead and show in that as my user to change the ownership so I can access it correctly. And now we're actually going to start the container and pass this in. So to start the container, I'm going to do docker run dash dash name. I'm going to call the container little root nginx. Uh, dash v here is our mount point specification. So it means that we can pass in sw raid nginx www. And we can pass that in. I'm going to do hmnt slash www. hmnt means host mount. I'm also going to specify read only here. You don't have to do this. Um, and in fact, in situations where you need to manipulate the data from within the Docker container, this is actually going to be a big pain if you mark it as read only. But since Nginx is just going to be serving static content, the idea with this is that our website content is on this raid backup. So it's being mirrored, right? If one disk fails, we can get it all back. But we're going to pass it transparently through to the Docker container here so that the Nginx instance can actually use it. Uh, now, the next thing I'm going to do is actually type in dash p here and expose port 80 to port 80. What this means is essentially inside of our Docker container, Nginx is going to be running on HTTP port 80. And I want to bridge that to port 80 on my host machine so that I can access the Nginx server by going to my host's IP address on port 80. That's all that means there. Then I'm going to do dash D nginx, and we can go ahead and start this container. So now if we go ahead and type docker ps, you'll see that this container has started. And you can see here that we're forwarding port 80 um, on our host to port 80 TCP on this docker container here. 
Now, if I can actually go ahead and copy this container ID and exec interactive to it with bash, and we're inside the container. How cool is that? If I do an ls on hmount www, you'll see that we've got some stuff there. Well, we don't. I'm going to make some stuff there. So I'm going to create um, this file here. And if we go back to our container, ls it again, you can see that it pops up in our container just like that. And then when you go and configure Nginx later, you can go in and specify that that's where you want the uh, static content to be served from. But I'll leave that for another video. I might do a separate one on actually fully configuring Nginx, setting up HTTPS, doing all kinds of fun stuff like that. So cool. Next, we're going to move on to setting up a Minecraft server in another container that we're going to use for games. I can also just quickly go ahead and show you that Nginx is working real quick because I figure you might want to see that. So as you can see here, if we just go to HTTP 192.168.1.85, replace your IP with whatever it is, we get this little message here to say that Nginx is properly installed and working. So let's move on to something else. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is make the directory our Minecraft server is going to live in. So I'm going to make games mc server in my password and I'm going to cheer it as me. Now the next thing you wanted to go ahead and do is come on over to this website here, uh, minecraft.net enus download server, and you can right click on this, copy the link, and what we're going to do is go back to our server, cd into hd software raid games mc server and just let me make sure yep wget is installed and paste this in right here so that we can download it directly onto the server this just saves us from having to scp it over late later um, wget is just um, a tool for downloading files from the internet so now you'll see we've got server.jar in here just like that now we're going to create our container for the uh, minecraft server I'll break down this command for you because this is what we're going to use. docker run dash it for interactive because after we start the container we're going to want to log on to it and um, configure some things. dash p 255.65.255.65 that's the default Minecraft port. So we're going to forward 255.65 from the host to 255.65 on the container. The name I'm going to be calling it little root Minecraft keeping in with our theme. The mount point that we're specifying is this one right here. So HTD software raid games Minecraft server to host mount Minecraft server. Uh, we're going to be using the Debian image and we want to run bash. So we go ahead and do that. It'll create the container for us and we can do a docker ps to see what the ID is. Now we can go ahead and log on to this one. All right, exec bash onto it and uh, we're in the container we can begin setting things up. So there's another really great um, website here that I'm looking at which is linked on the Minecraft server download page. It's the official um, it's the official documentation for setting up a server and you can use this to customize any parameters that you like but this is the section that we are interested in uh, which is the dependencies. So as you can see here for Debian, it recommends that we install OpenJDK. Now I'm gonna say one thing here because this video is targeted towards people that maybe aren't as confident with the command line and server administration. Copying and pasting commands from the internet is a very well-known meme at this point, and you should never do that without understanding what the commands do. So this command right here that we're gonna be copying, <laughs> uh, apt update is gonna update our package repositories, and this is harmless because it just makes sure that we have the latest version of the package repositories available. This next one is just going to install OpenJDK from the official repositories. So this one is perfectly fine to go ahead and copy paste. So we're going to grab that. We're going to come back to our container. We're going to paste this. <laughs> because the container doesn't have sudo in it, we're going to get rid of that. We don't even need it because we're on the root shell. And as you can see here, it's going to update our package repository and then it's going to fail to find OpenJDK 16. The reason for this is because the Minecraft wiki documentation is actually out of date. On Debian, we've moved on to OpenJDK 17. Um, so this is the one you're going to want to grab instead. 
When you get to a certain level in proficiency, you can do little things like this, um, like the brain just kind of, your neurons just kind of go boom, 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 when the documentation is like wrong or out of date to try and figure out the workaround. Um, so now we're just going to go ahead and apt install OpenJDK 17 headless instead. This is going to be a big download, so I'll be right back when it's all done. The next thing I'm going to go ahead and do is add user MD Hoff because I just want a dummy user to run the Minecraft server as. Not really a fan of running it as root as you probably would be aware. Just going to use the same password as I've been using throughout the video, and I don't care about any of this other information. I just want the dummy user. Now that that's out of the way, we're going to install two things. You can install your preferred text editor, and you can install Screen. Screen is like a virtual terminal, basically. It lets you um, push a process to the background and then resume it to view what its logs are outputting. It's actually very useful. We're going to be using it to run the Minecraft server in the background. So now that that's done, sue into your user and go to where we are storing the server. Now. If you go back up here, you'll note that this is the command we need to run in order to run the server. So we're going to grab that. I'm going to create a file called start.sh. Give it a shebang to run it in bash. Paste the command in like this. And the first thing I'm going to go ahead and do is match up this jar file to what it's actually stored on on my disk, which is server.jar. Now set the dedicated am amount of WAM for your server. <laughs> you got to make the joke. The recommended amount of dedicated WAM is 4 gigabytes, so we're going to specify that. It's not actually what the recommended amount is, uh, I'm just doing it as a joke, but for our purposes today, 4 is fine. You might need to specify more depending on your use case. So go ahead and write that. I'm going to mark it as executable with Chmod, and we're going to start it up for the first time. It's going to unpack a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and it's going to generate its files, and then it's going to generate a EULA for us to accept, which of course we're going to go ahead and accept, because we've definitely read the EULA and we definitely agree with it. Isn't that right? Now that we've done that, we can start it up with start.sh. I'm going to let it start up correctly, generate the worlds and everything, and then I'll show you how to run it with screen. So I'm going to join you back once it's generated all of its things. So to run this thing with screen, you type in screen and then the command, so in our case start.sh. It'll start up the Minecraft server in a virtual terminal for us. To push this to the background, hold down control and then tap and release A and then tap and release D like this. As you can see we have detached and we're back at our terminal prompt. If I type screen-ls you can see here that I've got one session that's detached. To resume it you type screen-r and then the name of the screen socket, which is 5303 in my case. And as you can see, we're back in the Minecraft server. Control AD to detach, and we're all good. So let's go ahead and uh, bring Minecraft over here, and we'll see if we can go ahead and connect to it. So I'm going to put in the IP address of our new server. And as you can see there, it's shown up. I'm running 1.20.1 uh, because I haven't updated my client yet, but as you can see, the Minecraft server is showing up right there. So awesome. Next, we're going to configure some file server stuff with Samba. So I'll see you there. All right, guys, here's the mining that I did off camera. I just made a new directory, churned the directory, and this is what we're going to be passing into our Samba container. This is the command that I've come up with. 445 is Samba's port, so we're going to do pretty much the same thing as setting up the Minecraft server, except we're just going to change the port and the name and the mount path. I realized uh, when I was looking back over the footage that my beautiful face up here was actually blocking the command to create the Minecraft server one, so I'll uh, fix that in post, hopefully. I'll have done that, but yeah, here it is spaced down a little bit so you can actually see what the command is. So we're going to go ahead and start this one up like so. Go ahead and uh, figure out which one it is. It's this one here, so grab the ID and jump into it. And now we're going to do apt update, update our package repos, and we're going to install Samba. So apt cache search Samba. I believe it should just be called, yep, just be called Samba, and we're going to grab Samba, Samba common and Samba libs. 
get that right. <laughs> this is going to be another big uh, download, so again, I'll be back when it's done. So now, on this one, I'm also going to add another user. Password 1, our classic, don't care about any of this. And the reason I'm doing this is because Samba's user um, sort of structure is based around the Unix one as well. So you've got to have a Unix user to correspond to your Samba user. So now I'm going to do smb plus wd dash a md hof to create a Samba user for the Unix user md hof. I'm going to use password one again. And now change this to e to enable the user like that. Now to configure a share, and I'll show you real quick that we've got the um, public folder over here for us to use as our share. And I'm going to need to install Vim again, of course. I, uh, I always forget. I always forget. And then sometimes I'm punished when it says Vim not found, but I'm starting to catch myself now and I need to remember how to install Vim. So Vim Etsy slash SMB uh, Samba SMB.conf. And this is where our Samba config file is. So we're going to go right down to the bottom. And uh, it's got some example configs in here that are pretty useful. So down here somewhere, there should be an example one for us to steal. Um, maybe not. So I'll just go ahead and create a new one from scratch. So down right here at the bottom, I'm just going to steal this example from the ArchWiki and paste it in and we'll edit it because nobody has time to memorize how to configure Samba, let's be honest here. I'm going to change this to mdhoff underscore public. I'm going to call it that. The path to our share is hmnt slash public. Public, uh, I'm actually going to mark that as no. The, and the reason for that is because I still want to force you to log on. Uh, get rid of this writable, yes. And I believe to change the user, we specify users or user equals mdhoff like that. So now we're going to run the Samba service and um, we'll try and connect to it from a Windows host. To run Samba from within this container, just type smbd like that and it should be running. Now I'll grab our Windows host over here and what we're gonna do is map a network drive. So backslash backslash the IP address of our server slash ndhoff public going to ask us for credentials so we're going to enter the credentials for the Samba user that we created just before and I'll select remember here and there we go it's mounted so here's where it's really cool I'm just going to create a new uh, bitmap image why not and we're going to go back over here and if I do an ls of hmnt slash public you'll see that the new bitmap image is over here like that so Samba is working and is connectable by Windows hosts which is fantastic so all of our services are set up and running. Now something I'll note here real quick is that when your server host reboots, you may have to restart these containers with Docker start. And you may also have to restart whatever services were running inside them manually. Automatically setting these up is a little bit outside the scope of this video, but I may do another one in future on advanced automation tips for starting things automatically, running containers as they should, and starting containers pointing to a specific command. I might even get into Docker Compose later on. As this video was intended to be very simple, I've done exactly that. We're not diving into Docker Compose or any custom configuration files. We're just pulling official images, treating them like regular hosts, and um, setting up our services from there. So that's it for this section. Let's dive into the next one. Okay, we both agree firewalls are important, right? I mean, never in the history of ever have I ever been too lazy to configure a firewall, or never have you ever been too lazy to properly configure a firewall, that's for sure, right? I won't tell. But today, there's no excuse. We're going to be using UFW, which stands for Uncomplicated Firewall, and it really is just that. It's the easiest firewall I've ever used, guys. There's no excuse not to do it right. So to cop it, it's literally just apt install UFW. It's not very big, should only take a minute. And we're going to add exceptions for all of the services that we added earlier. So to do that, you do sudo ufw allow, and we're going to specify the ports. So 2222 is our SSH port. We're going to add that one first. 
Now we're going to go ahead and enable the UFW. So you can do that like this. And you can also add the system D service like that. Now that UFW is enabled, we can view our list of rules with UFW status. And you can see here that we have two rules created for 2222. One of them is IPv4 and the other is IPv6. Now, if you're using IPv6, you can keep that rule. I'm not. So what I'm actually gonna go ahead and do is delete that rule. So to do that, you can check your rules with status numbered. And as you can see, it adds a little number to the end. Now you can get rid of rules that you don't want with the delete and then the number. So I'm gonna get rid of the IPv6. If I go ahead and do this one again, I've only got the IPv4 rule. So now I'm gonna add um, the one for engine X on port 80. And I'm gonna add the one for Minecraft on 25565. So now we've got a firewall and I'll go ahead and get rid of those IPv6 ones later. But we've got a firewall that's configured to block all requests except the ones on the services that we've specified. Uh, my bad, I just realized I forgot to allow Samba on port 445 so make sure you do that as well okay this next part is going to be pretty fun we're going to set a message of the day and a custom bash prompt in my opinion these are little bits of personalization that every server needs it just makes the administration process more fun right it makes it feel more personal to you so if you're not aware the message of the day is this stuff that gets printed here when you log into the machine um, and this can actually be configured to be whatever you want. And that's why I say it can really add a bit of personal touch and personal flair. So uh, in my case, I usually like to add a little ASCII art that prints out. And as I mentioned before, my computers are all named after towns from Pokemon. So I like to print out ASCII art of a Pokemon that I associate with that particular location. So this machine's called Little Root. And I have this picture of um, Torchic right here that I'm going to convert to ASCII art and put as the message of the day. So to convert something to ASCII art, I use this program called ASCII Image Converter. If you're on Arch, you can get it from the AUR, but it's also available on GitHub. I'll link it in the description that you can go download, build and install. Um, so to run it, you just do ASCII Image Converter, pass it the image. You can also specify other things. So dash capital C makes the image color. Uh, dash uh, lowercase c increases the character set that it can pull from and then of course I don't want it printing out this big so we can specify things like a max width. Uh, let me see what width I might want for the message of the day. 50 is probably a bit on the high side so maybe I'll go with 45. So you can export that to a file using um, redirection like this. So essentially, this character here, if you're not familiar with bash redirection, takes the output of this uh, command right here and saves it to the file. So now that I've done that, I can SCP that over to um, my server. If you're not familiar with the SCP command, it's literally just copying a file over SSH. So you can do the same options that you would do here. And if I specify torchic.txt to mdhoff at my server's IP address. This here is the path that I want to copy it to. So in this scenario, I've copied this file to my home directory. And if I go ahead and log in, you can see that it's in my home directory. Now to add that to the message of the day, the file that you want to edit is called etsy slash MOTD. You can see this is what it's like on Debian by default. Informative, but boring. What I'm going to do now is uh, cat torchic.txt and redirect it to etsy MOTD. Now, if I cat out etsy MOTD, you can see this is what it looks like. If I go ahead and log into the machine again, you can see now that my little picture of torchic prints out. Pretty cool, right? So next we're going to set the bash prompt, which is set in bash RC. So bash RC, if you don't understand any of this, don't worry at all. There's one thing in particular that we're looking for, and that's where they set PS1 right here. So PS1 is this little bash prompt down here. Um, so if you wanna change your PS1, 
In fact, I could give you an example right now. If I go ahead and set PS1 to hello there, you can see that my prompt has now changed to hello there. So when we set it in bash RC, what we're doing is just setting it automatically when bash opens. I'm going to show you a really nice website where you can customize your bash prompt. I'll bring it up and I'll see you there. This is the fantastic website I was telling you about before. So it's bash-prompt-generator.org and it just lets you graphically configure your bash prompt. So when I use my prompts, I usually like to start off with a square bracket. So I can choose that over here from all of these prompt elements. So I can start off with a square bracket and it'll show you the preview down here of what it's going to be looking like. Then typically I follow up with my username, then the at symbol, then my host name, and then I might put a space, which you can specify with custom text down here. So you can put text. And this text can actually be anything you want. Like it can be completely garbage. You can fill your prompt up with garbage if you like, but I'm just gonna include a space. And then I like to have my working directory base name here. So um, I can see what directory I'm in. You can also do the entire working directory if you like. It's, it's pretty cool how flexible you can make it. Then I close it off with another bracket, add a dollar sign, and then add some more text with just a space. And that's the basics of my prompt. Now I can go ahead and, uh, oops, I hit the X on that by mistake. When they're this thin, it's pretty easy to do. So you can select an individual element and actually go up here and change the color. So I'm gonna make this one maybe some kind of orangey color. And then I might make this a green color. I might, might make this a blue color. Of course, I'm doing this very quickly without any regard for aesthetics. When you're going through and selecting your own custom one, maybe you can make it look a little bit nicer than mine. I'm gonna follow up with this orange again. Um, working directory, I'll make this just a red. And then I'll close this one out with another of this orange. So this is what my um, prompt is going to look like. Of course, feel free to make yours look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing than this. So you can copy it by um, grabbing this little icon down here. And then just go ahead and log on into the server. And then edit bash RC. Now remember, we're looking for this PS1 variable right here. So as you can see, this also includes a definition for PS1. So what we're going to be doing is getting rid of this entire line here and replacing it with this. If I can get my spacing right on this file here, there we go. So now uh, next time I log in, you'll notice that my prompt has updated to the custom one that we set just before. And it's as simple as that. Now, whenever I log in, I'm presented with my custom message of the day and a custom bash prompt. Just little touches of personalization like that make it feel more fun. If you've made it this far, I want to say thank you very much for watching the video and congratulations. If you've been following along, by now you'll have your own fully functional basic home server that's ready for you to bootstrap your own ideas and projects onto. It really is very exciting guys. Once you get this initial thing off the ground, the initial setup, the initial, you know, getting all of it ready, you can start bootstrapping and making it as a launch pad for your own infrastructure and your own ideas. The possibilities really are limitless. If you're good enough at programming, you can even make your own custom services. I've written a few of those and maybe I'll do a video on them in the future. But yeah, it's exciting stuff. It's cool stuff. It's, I always say, like I heard somebody say once, the cloud is just someone else's computer. So my thinking is why can't the cloud be my computer? And if you've been following along, congratulations because the cloud is now your computer as well. You don't have to worry about any companies stealing your data. You can just go to the living room or wherever your server is located and see the disks physically there in person and you're in con complete control. So congratulations. Thank you so much for watching the video. And if you've got any uh, ideas and stuff and projects that you've done with your server, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Thank you so much. Have a good day. The I to them so that when we go to this next step, which is v sudo, fuck. Um, 
this path is fine for demonstration purposes, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that, or not, because it seems I've already got one. That's embarrassing. Tap and release A, and then tap and release D in quick succession. So I'm going to execute that now. And as you can see, I detach from the screen session and I'm back here. So if I do a screen LS, are you fucking kidding me?